if you're not familiar with Ravage the Cat, then you are not watching the webcam. Ravage the Cat is the fuzzy orange kitty that is sitting in the lap of Garrett Ean, who has thankfully joined us. Garrett, go ahead and uh, speak directly into the microphone and introduce yourself. Hello, Daryl. It's good to be here. I am Garrett Ian, and I blog at FreeKeen and FreeConquered.org. Now, is it Ian or Ian? Ian, just like the first name, only it's a last name and spelled differently. Okay, yeah, the spelling is what threw me off. So I, I've been calling you the wrong name ever since I've known you. So I, I do apologize for that. And for people that aren't aware of what FreeConquered.org is, is could you explain that uh well your listeners may be familiar with freekeen.com which does a lot of news coverage and activism coverage in the keen new hampshire area free conquered is something that i started in october of 2010 to cover more of the capital area of new hampshire about an hour northeast of our current location in keen okay and how many bloggers do you have over at free conquered because freekeen has Probably close to a dozen different people that contribute to that blog. Mm -hmm. This is true. Free Concord's a little bit different. Uh, it's not as many prolific activists in Concord. So the only consistent contributor is myself, but I'll also publish content that you'll see from people around the state, such as Brad Jardis, who blogs from, I believe he's in Manchester now. But yeah, Free Keen uh, is definitely... I think that's supposed to be a secret. Uh, well, wherever he may be. But... Uh, Freekeen has definitely been the most prolific blog as far as attracting people to consistently contribute content. And I think I've actually heard that Freekeen is the number four news blog in all of New Hampshire. That would not surprise me. Uh, I think the only ones that are higher, WMUR, the Keen Sentinel possibly, or maybe the Union Leader, and then uh, Blue Hampshire possibly mm -hmm. well, i'm familiar with wmur they have a youtube channel and i notice that their video player on their website is sometimes very difficult to load it'll crash but if you go to youtube and you check out the videos they've uploaded there you'll get a nice clear video uh but one of the issues i found is not everything that they produce is put onto youtube so myself and other videographers here in new hampshire have a channel that we use freeman tv raw and everything that we shoot pretty much gets uploaded to that channel. So even if we don't use it in any edited content form, you'll still be able to see everything that happened that day that went on in front of our cameras. Now, Freeman TV Raw is a channel that was created by Derek J. Freeman. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my listeners may be familiar with him. He was a former co-host of Free Talk Live. He is the star of the documentary Derek J's Victimless Crime Spree, and he's currently, I don't know if he's working or interning, somehow he's doing stuff for Adam Kokesh and the Adam vs. the Man show down in uh, Herndon, Virginia, or Chantilly, it's somewhere down in that uh, micropolis area of Virginia. So Derek J. started Freeman TV, and that's Freeman with two threes instead of the letter E. So the Freeman TV Raw, is it also FR33, man? That is true. It is the FR33. It leads to some confusion, but I don't believe there is a Freeman TV Raw. Maybe I shouldn't be putting this out there. I should go grab the YouTube uh, channel right now, but... Yeah, it doesn't get that all that much traffic as far as raw video goes. I mean, there's not that many people that probably want to spend their days looking at hours of footage. But the fact that it's there, the fact that a record's being provided is, I think, what is very prolific about it. I'm actually not really a fan of raw video. Unless it's raw video of certain events. You know, I, I have put up some raw video, but it was video that was put up in such a way to where I was out covering an event and there wasn't any need to do editing such as back during 2009 there was the uh, town halls in which the patient 
what what was it? The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was being discussed. So a lot of politicians were holding the town hall meetings. So I went to some of those in South Carolina where I was living at the time. And the video that I took from those, I posted raw. There were other events where different politicians would attend, and I would post that video raw just because there was no need to edit. I see. So we'll talk more about video editing. I know you do a lot of stuff with the video editing. We'll talk about that coming up after this short time out on the Liberty Radio Network. This is Peace, Love, Liberty Radio. And if you have a call or have a question, give us a call, 603-435-1105. Welcome back to Peace, Love, Liberty Radio. I'm your host, Daryl W. Perry, and I am joined by Garrett Ian, whose last name I was totally butchering earlier. And Garrett is... Are you what? What do you consider yourself? The owner, the founder, the managing editor of FreeConquered.org. Editor is a fine title. Okay, so the editor of FreeConquered.org and a blogger slash contributor to Free Keen. And we were talking about raw video and video editing, and I know that you are one of the activists that love putting up raw video oh, and how I then do. later doing an edit. Now, what, in your opinion, would be the benefits of uploading raw video and then also putting up the edited video? Well, the first reason I began doing this was for technical reasons, because there was a disability on my part to get things accomplished when I was working with raw video files that my camera shoots in. I needed those video files converted in some way, and it very much kills two birds with one stone when I can just upload all those files and then download them uh, all at once, and then with those downloaded files really be able to work with them more specifically. So, okay, so hold on. Let, let me just pause for one second. Now, from a technical aspect, I can understand but why make the raw videos public? Why not just leave them as unlisted or private? And then it does the conversion that you need it to do, but it's not. And basically what I would consider to be in a lot of cases, unwatchable video. It's not made for consumers for sure. It's not, clipped for the boring spots when no one's talking and people are standing around. I do try to keep the audience in mind as far as not having the camera pointed at my feet for a large portion of time, just keeping the frame interesting at least. But that segues into the second point, the non-technical point as to why I would want to upload everything raw and make it public. Whenever there's a controversial video, and those will be your most hit videos, those are the videos that more people are going to watch and talk about, you can display what the controversy was in the most objective way by putting out everything that you can from the original encounter. And by showing all the raw video, no one can claim that you edited down what had originally happened, that things did not happen as they did. So for the reason that it makes the best objective record, I enjoy putting up the raw video and put it out there. I know that I don't go around and watch other people's raw video channels that also do this it would be a large waste of time because I know that if something interesting happens, they'll probably tag the video saying that this is the video where I get attacked or whatever it is that's interesting. Now, let, let me just sort of ask this. You said that you do it just in case there's a controversial event. You want every raw video to be up. Now, there was an instance uh, about a week and a half ago. I think it was where some people were out cop blocking me and you were among them and a drunken guy who you refer to as a drunken bro. He did have an affinity for the noun. He became violent and assaulted 
two of the four people that were out cop blocking on this evening. And you do have all of the raw video. So in that occasion, I do agree. It's good to have the raw video of something like that. But other things to where all of the raw video from yesterday's Bearcat event, there's a lot of that video that there's not really any reason, at least in my opinion, and I'm just one out of 7 billion people, so take my opinion for what it's worth. Although, unlike the other 7 billion people, or a lot of the other 7 billion people, I have a radio show. So, you take my opinion for whatever you think that's worth. I don't see the point of uploading everything that was shot yesterday. I have a lot of video that I took yesterday. I think I had 40... 35, 40 minutes of video. I edited that down to roughly 13, 15 minutes of video. Mm -hmm. The rest of the video that I have, there's no need for that to be online because it's not stuff that actually showed anything. Well, what were you using to shoot? I was using a Conan or a Canon uh, something, another. I don't know the brand. Okay, is it probably not a high definition camera? Uh, it actually was, but it's just things that there's not really any reason to put it online mm -hmm. because it doesn't really show anything going on. It was just me walking around, looking at some of the various vehicles that they had, and looking for inspection stickers. I thought it was interesting at the time, which is why I had the camera on. In hindsight, when I was watching the video, it was. Why did I film this? I'm not going to use this. Well, I see why some would take that approach uh, that aren't very experienced with filming uh, because you very much do need a good rig in order to get consistently good footage. I have a high-definition camera that cost me about $350 at the time. I don't believe Canon produces that model anymore. It's a Vixia HR, uh, HFR21, excuse me. And it shoots in 1080p, I shoot in 720p. But unless you're really using a high-quality camera, you get a good lighting, then uh, your video might not be all that watchable in the end. Also, No, when, like when I say not watchable, I mean there's no point of the video. It's just 47 seconds of me pointing at a fire truck looking for the inspection sticker. There's no point to watch that. So in my opinion, it's un It's good video. The video quality is good, but it's absolutely pointless. So therefore, I find it to be unwatchable. Could it be used as B-roll? Possibly, but I don't see why it should be posted for the world to see. If somebody wants the video clip, I'll send it to them. But otherwise, there's absolutely no reason to post that online, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand where you're coming from there. However, I find it the easiest way to get that out to somebody who may use it. There are some videographers that use other videographers' footage as B-roll, myself included. So looking for things that are just shot with a steady hand, you may have hours of great footage of police encounters, but because most things are shot by amateur videographers... They're shaky, the person isn't framed at the right moment. All of these things are detrimental to making a quality final product. So uh, some videographers here, uh, Dave Ridley is one who uses a lot of other people's footage in his own reports. So when he's discussing the Bearcat himself, you'll see video shot by someone who may have been at the Bearcat and posted raw video that he can use. Right, and in a situation like that, you know, I might reach out and say, hey, I've got some video. If you want it, I can send it to you. I just personally don't upload everything that I shoot. And we'll continue this conversation. And you can join in. Give us a call, 603-435-1105. It's Peace, Love, Liberty Radio on the Liberty Radio Network. You can go online to lrn.fm, listen to the show, watch the webcam. You can see Garrett's big, giant fro. Although right now it's not that big and giant because of the headphones. But I, I must say that you have the best fro of 
any white guy that I know. Why, thank you, Daryl. And we've been talking about video and videography and the benefits or what some people think are the benefits of posting everything that is videoed online. And I think that this is something that we're just going to have to agree to disagree on. Well, one of the largest aspects of why people wouldn't want to do it that we haven't gotten into is whether or not it's legally safe, considering all the things that are criminalized in this world, to be posting large and excess amounts of video of oneself. Yeah, there there are those aspects, and that's not really why I don't like posting everything, you know, if somebody's doing something that's illegal, you know, yes, people should be careful of what they video themselves doing. But at the same time, there are just certain things that it's better left not being shared with the world. Well, I think I take a fundamentally different approach there. I mean, there's plenty of subjects I don't care to discuss. But I think in the grand scheme of things, it's better that all things be put on the table than something be obscured and not really understood and analyzed. Okay, and uh, I'll go ahead and tell you one specific video that I think should never have been posted online. Uh And no, it's not two girls, one cup. We're not going to be shining a light on something that maybe shouldn't get a light shown on it, are we, Daryl? Uh, well, it had a light shown on it already, and it became a big deal. There was a video of, and I'm not going to give names, but there there was a video of some people who had been drinking and then decided to play with a taser. And that video was then posted online. And... Thankfully, the person that put it up online decided to pull it down after a couple of the people that were in the video requested that it be pulled. Although it doesn't really work like that with the internet. I'm sure that there are people that downloaded this before it got removed. I'm sure of that too. And I actually know someone that downloaded it before it got removed. But... To the best of my knowledge, that video is no longer online. It could be, again, to the best of my knowledge. Don't give me that look. To the best of my knowledge, it is not online. But that's something that never should have been posted online. And the reason in that instance is because the people, and I have seen this video, so I'm aware of what you're talking to about. The people in this video... uh, it reflected upon them negatively in, in some sort of sense, their behavior. W- would you agree that yes. was the reason it should have been taken down? Well, that's the reason I don't think that it ever should have been posted is because it did not show good judgment. I agree. While I do concur that if I was the person in the video, I would not have posted that video. At the same time, if I were the person in the video, I wouldn't have partaken in the actions in the video as well. So it's hard for me to make a judgment call there. I do have a certain level of respect, though, for the idea that the person was not ashamed of their actions, didn't mind the world knowing them, even if it is actions that most people in the community would look at and say, you probably don't want to be telling everybody that. Yes, uh, being intoxicated and playing with tasers is not something that is very wise and I don't think should be shown to the world. I definitely don't play with things that hurt me to that extent. So I I think we've pretty much covered the videography uh, aspect of what you do. And now you're one of the activists that you have done some in the system as well as out of the system activism. This is true. I, I will occasionally go down to the state house and put on a nice shirt and maybe even a tie and speak very politely and calmly before the representatives that have been elected by the people. So what what I would consider putting on your respectable person clothing and you know basically requesting that those that make the uh regulations and statutes that they don't infringe upon your rights and that they sort of leave you alone a little bit more. 
True. That there are some people that would say that doing such is begging permission. And I've you know, turned it around slightly and said, okay, let's say that you are jogging through a park and a mugger jumps out from behind a tree and points a gun at you and says, I'm going to kill you unless you give me all of your money. Would you consider it to be begging for permission to say, please don't kill me? I would probably do my best to keep silent and comply until I felt safe enough to respond if the chance ever arose. However, yes, I do not equate, I definitely don't equate the two because of uh, the the large amount of difference between the robber who is a perceived threat by all people universally as opposed to the government, which is perceived as this benevolent force that you're supposed to submit to because they'll help you. Right, but the government actually is a robber. And asking them to not throw you in jail for something that harms no one, you're not asking for permission. You're just requesting that they not aggress against you for doing something that harms no one. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been to the 420 rallies, and I don't know if you want to disclose publicly... Do you commit civil disobedience? Do, do you participate in civil disobedience? Well, the beauty of the 420 rallies in Concord is that you don't know what's going on at them. The police have no probable cause to be intervening when they see people smoking what may or may not be tobacco or cannabis. I find it very funny and ironic that they would not intervene if people were smoking something that's going to poison them and destroy their lungs. Yet if they're smoking something that's far less harmful, that's when there'd be an intervention. Oh, you mean some uh, herbs that actually help with arthritis. And some people actually claim that it helps with headaches, but that is not my experience. Though I have been told that uh, if one were to eat some brownies or some cookies that were made with butter with the THC, that that would help with the headaches. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't know if you know anything about the canna butter, I believe is what it's called, any of the medical aspects of that, but there are other forms of civil disobedience aside from just smoking weed in public. Well, even chalking the ground, there was a almost civil disobedience event in Concord at the 420 event about two years ago, and a state house security guard thought that he could get people arrested for chalking, but when he called the state police over, they never responded. So the general aspect of ignoring the disobedience or ignoring the dissent, uh, that's not the worst response that government could have given the situation. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned chalking because that uh, brings me to the chalking eight. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about I'm vaguely familiar with what happened, uh, but I, I would definitely like more details about that. And there are some people that probably have no clue what the Chalking Eight is. Oh, well, the Chalking Eight was a very large incident that happened in the summer of 2011 in Manchester, New Hampshire. It was June 4th when about 20 people at the time had gathered in front of the police station and the protest was over. What had just happened with the Manchester Police Department being acquitted of the beating of a man and also the killing of another man very recently. Okay, hold that thought and finish telling us about what happened because I know it ended with some arrest. Including an arrest of myself. Hence the term, the chalking eight. So we'll be back momentarily on Peace, Love, Liberty Radio. So if you have a question for Garrett Ian, go ahead. Give us a call, 603-435-1105. There is time for your question. And if we wind up do getting a telephone call, Garrett, we will take that. But otherwise, I want you to finish telling us about the Chalking 8, which happened in Manchester, you said back in 2011. Yes. It was in response to a Response murder? to, well, the... Manchester Police Department believes it was a successful intervention in which this guy and his daughter were locked up in their apartment. He was refusing to come out. They turned it into a giant SWAT raid. 
and ended up bursting into his house and shooting him in front of his daughter. So it was a murder? Pretty much. It was an unjustified killing, you could say, Um, especially when they have such technology as infrared cameras, as we saw yesterday at the Bearcat extravaganza. They could have used infrared technology to know when this guy was asleep, gone into his house when he had been laying still, and got him at the right moment where they didn't have to kill him, but they chose not to use those methods. So anyway, after that had just happened, they had also been uh, released of any uh, any accountability for wrongdoing in the beating of a man named Chris Miklovich, who got his face fractured by four off-duty officers one night. So after those things had just happened, there was a protest organized by copblock.org at the Manchester Police Department. About 20 people were outside. They began chalking the sidewalks. Police came, watched, didn't intervene. They began chalking the retaining wall of the police department. Police watched, didn't intervene, went back inside. At that point, there were two individuals who began chalking on the walls of the police department. Based on the content of their messages, and I believe also where they put the chalk, the police came out and became aggressive to all people chalking, even those chalking the sidewalk. What was the content of the message? The message that was put on Keep the wall. It clean for radio. Yes, I don't believe any profanity was okay. used in the chalkings. But it was very provocative. Right behind the fallen officer's memorial at the Manchester Police Department, on the wall there, someone had written, How many have been killed by Manch PD? I guess implying that there is no memorial for people who have been victims of police actions in the state of New Hampshire. Well, that's a very good question because in the. Just over eight months that I've lived here in Keene, there has been one murder, and the uh, murderer wears a shiny badge and works for the Keene Police Department. So instead of being punished as a normal person would be, I'm fairly certain that this person was commended and possibly given a medal. So it is a very valid question to ask how many people has the police killed. So from that point on, the police, as you can imagine, were less polite than they had been earlier in the day. There was one sergeant in particular who you could tell was being treated as the officer in command, and he was giving orders to have people arrested. About two hours later is when I was arrested with a group of two others, and we were arrested for refusing to move, allegedly. He ordered police from across the street to arrest us for not continuing to walk backwards. Now, they claim that the order was initially valid because we had been standing near chalkings and the chalkings were a crime scene that needed to be documented and that they were using their authority to close the crime scene. But after we had left the crime scene, it then became just this indefinite range which we needed to keep going backwards until we were nearly in the street at the time they called for our arrest. Okay, and your charge was what? Uh, failure to obey or disorderly conduct? Somewhere in there. It was two counts of disorderly conduct for refusing two an counts. order to move. Yes, one of the counts they never even tried to substantiate in court. One count was that I refused to move from the crime scene, and then another count was that I refused to move. I don't even remember how it was worded exactly, but it was two very bogus counts of refusing to move when I was never ordered to move initially and when I was in a place where the police had no authority to even issue orders to move because police can't just go up to random people and tell them that they have to move. Well, they might not, based on their own rules, have the authority to do so, but as we know, they can and will do whatever they like. And that includes arresting someone for the sole reason of you were resisting arrest, which I believe was the only charge against Ademo and he was charged with Kate. A, yes, Kate was charged with resisting arrest as well as refusing to move. She was, I believe, the first person who was arrested for refusing to move, and she was arrested when she was by herself. They came in, swept up one small person, and then they went after a group of three other people. It was like they were escalating it very slowly as much as they could. Well, I I know that it was one of those two. It was either Ademo or Kate whose only charge that actually stood was the resisting arrest charge. 
I believe the resisting arrest charge was the only charge of hers that was of a great enough magnitude to carry over to superior court and get a jury trial. So she had a jury trial specifically on that one charge. Okay, I I thought the other charges had been dropped because I I know that I've asked the question, how can you be arrested for resisting arrest when you are not otherwise being under arrest? It is pretty silly. But yeah, that was pretty much a situation with her. It was within 10 seconds of of a police officer asking her to move away from some chalk that he's grabbing for her arm. She moves her arm out of the way. That's her resisting arrest charge right there. And it, it's very ludicrous the way the resisting arrest statute is written in New Hampshire. But fortunately, I was the only one out of the eight people who did go to, uh, well, not eight went to trial. It was about, I believe, four went to trial. Uh, I was the only one who was able to beat all of the charges against me. One of the charges they didn't try to substantiate. And the the refusing to move charge, they failed miserably at substantiating that because the officer cited the fact that I was outside of the crime scene area and that he uh, was arresting me based on a Manchester City ordinance that I had to move if I was in a group of three, which I, I never claimed to be in any group. So that that sounds very much like the unlawful assembly to where they say any time three or more people are in any place, they are required to have permits to assemble, despite the fact that there are supposedly rights that are protected that protect the right to assembly, and the fact that some people have families that are larger than three people. So does that mean that every father, wife, son, daughter, grandparent group must have some you know, supposed permit to be able to assemble to walk down the sidewalk together? Mm. Well, the police will act as though they're right regardless of whether or not the information they have is correct. And oh, unfortunately for John Patty, my arresting officer, the information he had was incorrect about the law. And we only have about two and a half minutes left. You have court on Tuesday, so if you could summarize that fairly quickly. I have a very fun case coming up very soon. It involves the officer who actually inspired me to start my blog by physically stopping me from recording the police one night when he ripped a cell phone out of my hands. So on Tuesday, we're going to have a trial because about a year after that, I was recording when myself and two friends were walking our bicycles and he showed up and he wrote me a ticket for not having a light on the bike that I was not riding. Okay, so you were given a ticket for not having a light on a bicycle that you were not riding and you attempted to film this and you were prevented from filming he didn't prevent me from filming the second time he was respectful enough to keep his hands off me during this encounter but he did leave me with a piece of paper from his company saying that i owed 29 dollars and 76 cents and for anyone that may possibly be in the concord new hampshire area and i consider the concord new hampshire area to be anywhere in new hampshire because concord is pretty centrally close to every populated area in new hampshire what time is your court hearing and what is the location the piece of paper says it begins at 8 30 a.m but that's what it says to probably about everybody they're having come in that morning it'll be a trial so they probably won't be going on till about 9 30 but it's at concord district court on clinton street and they got free parking there come check it out okay so clinton street for anyone that is not aware is exit number two off of Interstate 89. You can hit 89 from the, I I guess we're southwest. If you take Route 9 all the way to 89, continue on to 89 South, then hit exit two if you're coming up from Manchester, 93 to 89. And, yeah, hopefully people show up and support you, and hopefully there's a lot of video cameras. And are you requesting that people stand for the judge? Oh, individuals are free to do whatever they choose, but I'll be happy to have anybody come out that's respectful, and I'll put on a good show. All right. Thank you, Garrett, for joining us. Always a pleasure. You can find him at freeconquered.org.